Our second reading is from the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, beginning at the 10th verse. Then Jesus called the crowd and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you not also without, still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Groucho Marx once famously said, I don't want to belong to any club that will accept me as one of its members. In that one sentence, he satirically captures the human need to gather into groups. And then the inevitable consequence, the human desire to control the group's membership so that the wrong people don't get in. We join groups because of common interests or goals. Membership in a group gives us identity and purpose. A sense of belonging is crucial to our life satisfaction, our mental and physical health, and even our longevity. There are a lot of good things that come from membership. But our gospel reading today also offers some caution. One story concerns Jesus and his disciples breaking a rule, and the other is about a foreign woman receiving God's grace. Both stories speak to us about the issues of joining a group and then going out of our way to guard the gates or to build fences to keep the outsiders out. In the first part of today's Gospel reading, reading Jesus confronts the Pharisees with a challenge to one of their rules. Now, to get to the stake at what is at issue today, we actually have to go back a few verses. At the beginning of the chapter, we read, The Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. And where do you suppose that rule comes from? I'll give you a hint. It did not come from their mothers. People did not know about germs back then. No, this rule comes from the religious authorities themselves. People like the scribes and the Pharisees looked for everything that God ever commanded to the Israelites over the course of many years, and then they reinterpreted those rules 
to fit their own time and place. This is not unlike our own Supreme Court that reinterprets old rules for contemporary issues. And these layers and layers of interpretation over many, many years became known as the tradition of the elders. And by the time of Jesus, this tradition had developed over 600 rules. The rule about hand washing probably derived from an old priestly ritual found in the book of Exodus. And though it had nothing to do with germs, it did symbolically separate the clean from the unclean, that is to designate between the holy and the unholy. Such rituals identified the Israelites as the chosen people of God, and according to the Pharisees, those who did not wash their hands were separated from the holiness of God and also from the holy community. So for the Pharisees, this simple ritual was a membership criteria that carried a lot of weight. And just how much weight? Now I find this very interesting. We read that the Pharisees and the scribes come to Jesus from Jerusalem. But where is Jesus at this time? Again, go back a few verses. Jesus has been on a boat. He has just walked on water. And now that boat carrying Jesus and his disciples cross that body of water and they land at Gennesaret. Now I invite you to look at a map. Gennesaret and Jerusalem are some 80 miles apart. This story would have us believe that the Pharisees walk 80 miles in order to tell the disciples to wash their hands before they eat. Making me think, of course, that maybe their mothers were involved after all. But the point of the story is that the Pharisees take their rules very seriously and they very rigorously guard the gates of membership. But Jesus essentially tells them, hey guys, you are wasting way too much time and energy trying to keep people out of your club. But God is in charge here and God will call others. Do you know what really defiles people? That is what really makes them unholy? It's when they mistreat each other. It's when instead of love, they practiced adultery and theft and false witness and slander. And now things get even more interesting because we are soon to learn just how seriously Jesus takes his own argument. In an ultimate divine sense of fair play, he is going to do just what he asked the Pharisees to do, to lighten up and let go of the legalism. Jesus is about to break one of his own rules. Again, we need to go back, this time a few chapters, to Matthew 10, where we find Jesus saying to his disciples, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And yet off Jesus goes, traveling from Gennesaret to the district of Tyre and Sidon, some 50 miles away, right into the heart of Gentile territory. And there he encounters a Canaanite woman. And this poor woman needs help because her daughter is very ill. And she shouts out to Jesus, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. And Jesus ignores her. She keeps shouting at him, pleading for help. Nope, Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She keeps begging. No way, Jesus said, no way I'm going to take this gift intended for Israel and throw it away to the unchosen and the undeserving. She keeps begging, I know, I know, but even some of the leftovers will do, please. And Jesus relents and heals her daughter. Now much has been made of this Canaanite woman's faith, and rightfully so. And commentators have fallen all over themselves trying to explain why Jesus was so initially rude to this woman, like, 
Or maybe he was just having a bad day like we all do sometimes. Maybe this just demonstrates that Jesus was also human. Maybe sometimes he just gets tired of dealing with people and all of their endless needs. And as one commentator notes, he just got caught with his compassion down. But think about this. Maybe Jesus sets this all up as a lesson to his disciples and also to us. After all, Jesus is not going to chastise the Pharisees for being too legalistically rigid and trying to keep people out and then turn around and do the same thing himself. No, maybe Jesus wants to set up the most striking contrast possible between the Pharisees who purportedly walk 80 miles to close the gate to outsiders by enforcing a rule, and Jesus himself who travels some 55 miles in order to break a rule and to hold the gate wide open. And not just any old gate that anyone could just casually swing open. No, this gate that Jesus opens is locked and bolted, fastened securely to keep the outsiders out, and Jesus himself has done the locking and the bolting. But you see, he wants us to know that the gate that opens the widest is the one that has been the most tightly shut. Pay attention, you disciples, because this is how Jesus does things. Jesus, who starts out just as stubborn as the Pharisees, arguably even more so, completely pivots and grants a foreign woman a request. Jesus gives up his own rule to minister to this foreigner. Do you really think that Jesus would give up his own rule in order to minister to an outsider? Do you think that Jesus would give up something that precious to himself in order to meet somebody else's needs? Do you detect a theme here? Maybe even a little symbolic foreshadowing? Just when we think we have it all figured out, just when we think we have the right beliefs, the proper rules, the ideal church or the model denomination, then God reminds us, I will gather others. Jesus once famously said, for when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. But we often, however, seem to misunderstand this. We say when two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, then we'd better draw up some bylaws. How can we, as a church, be faithful to our calling and yet not act as guardians of the gate? We want to be firm in our beliefs, strong in our faith, true to our calling as disciples, and yet humble, hospitable, and humane. Ultimately, perhaps, it's an attitude. We who claim to be members of the body of Christ hardly ever, if ever, get to choose the membership criteria for others. Leave that up to Jesus. I would like to close with a story told by an eminent New Testament scholar, Amy Jill Levine, one of the best ever New Testament experts, a professor at Hartford Seminary, who also happens to be a devout practicing Jew. I have modified her story slightly. She writes, after a long and happy life, I find myself at the pearly gate standing before St. Peter. As I stand in line, I hear behind me a man trying to get Peter's attention. This fellow has his Bible open to John 14, and he is frenetically pointing to verse 6. Jesus says right here, in red letters, that he is the way. This woman is not a Christian. She's not baptized. She shouldn't be here. Wait here, says Peter, while I go get the boss. He returns a few minutes later with a rather short man, dark hair. He looks, well, rather Jewish. I notice immediately that he has holes in his hands and his feet and a heel wound in his side. What is it, my son? He asked the man. 
The man sputters, I don't mean to be rude, but didn't you say that no one comes to the Father except through you? Well, responds Jesus, I did say that, but that is not all that I said. I also said, I am the good shepherd. I came to lead people in, not to keep them out. And elsewhere, you will notice that I say I am not interested in those who practice empty rituals and enforce rules as ends in themselves, but in those who do their best to live a righteous life, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting people in prison, welcoming the stranger. And this woman has done all that. So becoming almost apoplectic, the man interrupts, but that's works righteousness. You're saying that she earned her way into heaven? No, not at all, Jesus replies. I am saying that I am the way, not you. And I am making that determination, and it is by my grace that anyone gets here, including you. Do you want to argue with that? No argument here. God says, I will gather others. And I would like to be a member of that club, wouldn't you? Amen. <laughs>